Hello, everybody. Hope you're having a great day today. My name is Steve. Thank you so much for stopping by my channel. So today I'm going to be doing something a little bit different from what I normally do on my channel. We're actually going to be reading something called A Short Guide to Great Britain. Now, this booklet or pamphlet was created in 1943 by the War and Navy Departments in Washington, D.C. And basically, this is a little booklet that was given to U.S. servicemen when they were headed out to Great Britain in 1943 at the height of World War II. And the reason I wanted to read this for you guys or with you guys is because I started reading it. I read like the first three or four pages, I think, and I just was blown away at kind of the insights it gave me into what life was like for the people in Great Britain in 1943 during the height of World War II. This was just fascinating, just a little bit I read. And so I stopped and I was like, OK, I'm going to read this um, with you guys here on the channel, because I think a lot of you would find this interesting. And I'm sure some people watching right now has probably seen this or read this little pamphlet or this book, but I'm guessing probably, I don't know, 98% of you guys have probably never picked this up and read this. So I just thought it'd be really interesting to kind of read this together and, uh, you know, kind of understand what life was kind of like in Great Britain in 1943. You know, um, this is something that very few people alive today actually lived through. And, uh, you know, World War II. And, I mean, what, you were 80 years old, basically, when this came out. So what they were talking about here, you would have to be at least in your mid-80s to remember anything at all about this, really. And so I just think that's fascinating, guys. And uh, I, think, I think this is going to be a very interesting read. So enough rambling. Let's go ahead and dive in and start reading A Short Guide to Great Britain. 1943. That's incredible, guys. And so obviously when this says something like you or us is talking about the U.S. servicemen uh, or the United States of America, I guess, um, because it's talking about Great Britain. It's, it's basically informing the servicemen, the U.S. servicemen of what life is like for the people in Great Britain so they can kind of be prepared for what they're going to come across when they leave the U.S. and go to Great Britain in 1943, if you understand what I'm saying. So anyways, guys, enough rambling. Let's go ahead and dive in and check this out. You are going to Great Britain as part of an Allied offensive to meet Hitler and beat him on his own ground. For the time being, you will be Britain's guest. The purpose of this guide is to start getting you acquainted with the British, their country, and their ways. America and Britain are allies. Hitler knows that they are both powerful countries, tough and resourceful. He knows that they, with the other United Nations, mean his crushing defeat in the end. So it is only common sense to understand that the first and major duty Hitler has given his propaganda chiefs is to separate Britain and America and spread distrust between them. If he can do that, his chance of winning might return. If you come from an Irish-American family, you may think of the English as persecutors of the Irish, or you may think of them as enemy redcoats who fought against us in the American Revolution. But there is no time today to fight old wars over again or bring up old grievances. We don't worry about which side our grandfathers fought on in the Civil War because it doesn't mean anything now. We can defeat Hitler's propaganda with a weapon of our own, plain common horse sense, understanding of evident truth. The most evident truth of all is that in their major ways of life, the British and American people are much alike. They speak the same language. They both believe in representative government, in freedom of worship, in freedom of speech. But each country has minor national characteristics which differ. It is by causing misunderstanding over these minor differences that Hitler hopes to make his propaganda effective. You defeat enemy propaganda not by denying that these differences exist but by admitting them openly and then trying to understand them. For instance, the British are often more reserved in conduct than we. On a small, crowded island where 45 million people live, each man learns to guard his privacy carefully and is equally careful not to invade another man's privacy. So if Britons sit in a train or bus without striking up conversation with you, it doesn't mean they, they are being haughty or unfriendly. Probably they are paying more attention to you than you think but they don't speak to you because they don't want to appear intrusive or rude. Another difference. 
The British have phrases of their own that may sound funny to you. You can make just as many boners in their eyes. It isn't a good idea, for instance, to say bloody in mixed company in Britain. It is one of their worst swear words. To say I look like a bum is offensive to their ears. For the British, this means that you look like your own backside. <laughs> I've learned that, man. Uh, British money is in pounds, shillings, and pence. This also explained more fully later on. The British are used to this system and they like it. And all your arguments that the American decimal system is better won't convince them. They won't be pleased to hear you call it funny money either. <laughs> they sweat hard to get it. Wages are much lower in Britain than America. And they won't think you smart or funny for mocking at it. The British dislike bragging and showing off. American wages and American soldiers' pay are the highest in the world. When payday comes, it would be sound practice to learn to spend your money according to British standards. They consider you highly paid. They won't think any better of you for throwing money around. They are more likely to feel that you haven't learned the common sense virtues of thrift. The British Tommy is apt to be especially touchy about the difference between his wages and yours. Keep this in mind. Use common sense and don't rub him the wrong way. You'll find many things in Britain physically different from similar things in America, but there are also important similarities. Our common speech, our common law, and our ideals of religious freedom were all brought from Britain when the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock. Our ideas about political liberties are also British, and parts of our own Bill of Rights were borrowed from the great charters of British liberty. Remember that in America, you like people to conduct themselves as we do and to respect the same things. Try to do the same for the British in respect to the things they treasure. Don't be misled by the British tendency to be soft-spoken and polite. If they need to be, they can be plenty tough. The English language didn't spread across the oceans and over the mountains and jungles and swamps of the world because these people were panty wastes. 60,000 British civilians, men, women, and children have died under bombs, and yet the morale of British is unbreakable and high. A nation doesn't come through that if it doesn't have plain common guts. The British are tough, strong people and good allies. You won't be able to tell the British much about taking it. They are not particularly interested in taking it anymore. They are far more interested in getting together in solid friendship with us so that we can all start dishing it out to Hitler. You will find out right away that England is a small country, smaller than North Carolina or Iowa. By the way, that's where I'm from. I'm from North Carolina, so putting that in perspective is, is wild to me. The whole of Great Britain, that is England and Scotland and Wales together, is hardly bigger than Minnesota. England's largest river, the Thames, is not even as big as the Mississippi when it leaves Minnesota. No part of England is more than 100 miles from the sea. If you are from Boston or Seattle, the weather may remind you of home. If you are from Arizona or North Dakota, you'll find it a little hard to get used to. At first, you will probably not like the almost continual rains and mists in the absence of snow and crisp cold. Actually, the city of London has less rain for the whole year than many places in the United States, but the rain falls in frequent drizzles. Most people get used to the English climate eventually. If you have a chance to travel about, you will agree that no area of the same size in the United States has such a variety of scenery. At one end of the English Channel, there is a coast like that of Maine. At the other end are the great white chalk cliffs of Dover. The lands of South England and the Thames Valley are like farm or grazing lands of the eastern United States, while the lake country in the north of England and the highlands of Scotland are like the white mountains of New Hampshire. In the east where England bulges out towards Holland, the land is almost Dutch in appearance, low, flat, and marshy. Yorkshire in the north and Devon in the southwest will remind you of the badlands of Dakota and Montana. On furlough, you will probably go to cities where you will meet the Britain's pride and age and tradition. You will find that the British care little about size, not having the biggest of many things as we do. For instance, London has no skyscrapers, not because English architects couldn't design one, but because London is built on swampy ground, not on a rock like New York, and skyscrapers need something solid to rest their foundations on. In London, they will point out to you buildings like Westminster Abbey, where England's kings and greatest men are buried, and St. Paul's Cathedral with its famous dome, 
and the Tower of London, which was built almost a thousand years ago. All of these buildings have played an important part in England's history. They mean just as much to the British as Mount Vernon or Lincoln's birthplace do to us. The largest English cities are all located in the lowlands near the various sea coasts. In the southeast on the Thames is London, which is the combined New York, Washington, and Chicago, not only of England, but of the far-flung British Empire. Greater London's huge population of 12 million people is the size of Greater New York City and all the suburbs with the nearby New Jersey cities thrown in. It is also more than a quarter of the total population of the British Isles. The great Midland manufacturing cities of Birmingham, Sheffield, and Coventry, sometimes called the Detroit of Britain, are located in the central part of England. Nearby on the west coast are the textile and shipping centers of Manchester and Liverpool. Further north in Scotland is the world's leading shipping, shipbuilding center of Glasgow. On the east side of Scotland is the historic Scottish capital, Edinburgh. Scene of the tales of Scott and Robert Louis Stevenson, which many of you read in school. Britain may look a little shop-worn and grimy to you. The British people are anxious to have you know that you are not seeing their country at its best. There's been a war on since 1939. The houses haven't been painted because factories are not making paint. They're making planes. The famous English gardens and parks are either unkept because there are no men to take care of them, or they are being used to grow needed vegetables. British taxi cabs look antique because Britain makes tanks for herself, and Russia hasn't time to make new cars. British trains are cold because power is needed for industry, not for heating. There are no luxury dining cars on trains because total war effort has no place for such frills. The trains are unwashed and grimy because men and women are needed for more important work than car washing. Wow. Man, just really, really puts into perspective what the British people were going through, you know, 85 years ago, basically. The British people are anxious for you to know that in normal times, Britain looks much prettier, cleaner, neater. Although you'll read in the papers about lords and sirs, England is still one of the great democracies in the cradle of many American liberties. Personal rule by the king has been dead in England for nearly a thousand years. Today the king reigns, but does not govern. The British people have great affection for their monarch, but they have stripped him of practically all political power. It is well to remember this in your comings and goings about England. Be careful not to criticize the king. The British feel about that the way you would feel if anyone spoke against our country or our flag. Today's king and queen stuck with the people through the blitzes and had their home bombed just like anyone else, and the people are proud of them. Today, the old power of the king has been shifted to parliament, the prime minister and his cabinet. The British parliament has been called the mother of parliaments because almost all the representative bodies in the world have been copied from it. It is made up of two houses, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. The House of Commons is the most powerful group and is elected by all adult men and women in the country, much like our Congress. Today, the House of Lords can do little more than add its approval to laws passed by the House of Commons. Many of the titles held by the Lords, such as Baron, Duke, and Earl, have been passed from father to son for hundreds of years. Others are granted in reward for outstanding achievement, much as American colleges and universities give honorary degrees to famous men and women. These customs may seem strange and old-fashioned, but they give the British the same feeling of security and comfort that many of us get from the familiar ritual of a church service. The important thing to remember is that within this apparently old-fashioned framework, the British enjoy a practical, working 20th century democracy, which is in some ways even more flexible and sensitive to the will of the people than our own. The best way to get on in Britain is very much the same as the best way to get on in America. The same sort of courtesy and decency and friendliness that go over big in America will go over big in Britain. The British have seen a good many Americans and they like Americans. They will like your frankness as long as it is friendly. They will expect you to be generous. They are not given to backslapping and they are shy about showing their affections. But once they get to like you, they make the best friends in the world. 
In getting along, the first important thing to remember is that the British are like the Americans in many ways, but not in all ways. You will quickly discover differences that seem confusing and even wrong, like driving on the left side of the road and having money based on an impossible accounting system and drinking warm beer. But once you get used to things like that, you will realize that they belong to England just as baseball and jazz and Coca-Cola belong to us. The British of all classes are enthusiastic about sports, both as amateurs and as spectators of professional sports. They love to shoot, they love to play games, they ride horses and bet on horse races, they fish, but be careful where you hunt or fish. Fishing and hunting rights are often private property. The great spectator sports are football in the autumn and winter and cricket in the spring and summer. See a match in either of these sports whenever you get a chance. You will get a kick out of it, if only for the differences from American sports. I still need to check out cricket. You know, that's, that's definitely a sport I don't, I know nothing about. Um, you know, I'm surprised I don't see rugby mentioned here. Hmm. Cricket and football. Obviously, I know football is very, very big in in Britain, but cricket. I'm wondering if that's bigger than rugby. Anyway, cricket will strike you as slow compared with American baseball, but it isn't easy to play well. You will probably get more fun out of village cricket, which corresponds to sandlot baseball than you would out of one of the big three-day professional matches. Football in Britain takes two forms. They play soccer, which is known in America, and they also play rugger, which is a rougher game and close to American football, but is played without the padded suits and head guards we use. Rugger. Rugger must be rugby. All right. That must be what it used to be called, or at least that's what they called it in America at the time. Let me know in the comments, guys. Is rugger uh, a word you guys would have used in Britain at some point, or maybe even still, to describe rugby? Rug rugger requires 15 on a side, uses a ball slightly bigger than a football, and allows lateral but not forward passing. The English do not handle the ball as cleanly as we do, but they are far more expert with their feet. In all English games, no substitutes are allowed. If a man is injured, his side continues with 14 players and so on. Wow. You know, I just learned a little bit more about rugby, and I did not learn that. Obviously, I know about the passing only backwards or laterally, but um, okay, that's interesting. So if someone gets injured, you have to, you still play. And if you don't have enough people, wow. You will find that English crowds at football or cricket matches are more orderly and more polite to the players than American crowds. If a fielder misses a catch at cricket, the crowd will probably take a sympathetic attitude. They will shout, good try, even if it looks to you like a bad fumble. In America, the crowd would probably shout, take him out. This contrast should be remembered. It means that you must be careful in the excitement of an English game not to shout out remarks which everyone in America would understand but which the British might think insulting. That's interesting because um, I've, I've reacted to a few different videos about, you know, like English insults, uh, you know, at a, I don't know what games, maybe football or rugby and uh, they were pretty crazy. <laughs> so I don't know if that's changed since 1943 or or what but or if it's just a certain small segment of the population that really gets into it like that but uh wow that's definitely a little seems a little bit different today i'm not sure in general more people play games in britain than in america and they play the game even if they're not good at it you can always find people who play no better than you and are glad to play with you they are good sportsmen and they are quick to recognize good sportsmanship whenever they meet you meet it wow you know um that's interesting. I I, I I do believe that from my journey so far, I believe that you guys in the UK as a whole, you know, tend to be into sports a little bit more than we are in America. And Americans are into their sports, but I, I think I think you guys might have us beat there. I think you guys, the sports that you love, you tend to be really into them a lot. You know, the rugby's, the football, cricket maybe, I don't know. The British have theaters and movies, which they call cinemas, as we do. But the great place of recreation is the pub. A pub or public house is what we could call a bar or tavern. The usual drink is beer, which is not an imitation of German beer as our beer is, but ale. But they usually call it beer or bitter. 
Not much whiskey is now being drunk. Wartime taxes have shot the price of a bottle up to about $4.50. Wow. Wow. In 1943, a bottle of whiskey was $4.50. That seems like a lot. Wow, man. I don't know what the conversion would be to pounds back in 1943, but that's got to be a lot of money back then. Wow. The British are beer drinkers, as am I. That's, that's, that's my drink of choice. Um, and can hold it. The beer is now below peacetime strength, but can still make a man's tongue wag at both ends. I love a good... I prefer a good cold beer, but I can drink a warm beer too. No big deal. Um, but I definitely prefer a nice cold beer. Um, much more than I do like uh, whiskey or something like that. You will be welcome to the British pubs as long as you remember one thing. The pub is the poor man's club, the neighborhood or village gathering place where the men have come to see their friends, not strangers. If you want to join a darts game, let them ask you first, as they probably will. And if you are beaten, it is the custom stand aside and let someone else play. I, I definitely look forward to visiting a British pub. I think that's just going to be a very interesting atmosphere to uh, to check out, um, you know, finally when I get over there. The British make much of Sunday. All the shops are closed. Most of the restaurants are closed. And in the small towns, there's not much to do. You had better follow the example of the British and try to spend Sunday afternoon in the country. British churches, particularly the little village churches, are often very beautiful inside and out. They absolutely are. The ones I've seen anyway. You will naturally be interested in getting to know your opposite number, the British soldier, the Tommy, you have heard and read about. You can understand that two actions on your part will slow up the friendship, swiping his girl, and, and not appreciating what his army has been up against. Yeah, I can imagine both of those would uh, be a bad idea. Yes, and rubbing it in that you are better paid than he is. Okay, yeah, self-explanatory, I mean... Yeah, it's kind of a kind of a dick move, man, <laughs> to, to do that. Children the world over are easy to get along with. British children are much like our own. The British have reserved much of the food that gets through solely for their children. To the British children, you as an American will be something special. For they have been fed at their schools and impressed with the fact that the food they ate was sent to them by Uncle Sam. You don't have to tell the British about Lynn Lee's food. They know about it and appreciate it. I don't know what Lynn Lee's food is. I, I, I don't know what that means exactly. If someone knows what Lynn Lee's food is, please let me know in the comments, guys. You can rub a Britisher the wrong way by telling them we came over and won the last one. Each nation did its share, but Britain remembers that nearly a million of her best manhood died in the last war. America lost 60,000 in action. Such arguments and the war debts along with them are dead issues. Nazi propaganda now is pounding away day and night, asking the British people why they should fight to save Uncle Shylock and his silver dollar. Don't play into Hitler's hands by mentioning war debts. Neither do the British need to be told that their armies lost the first couple of rounds in the present war. We've lost a couple ourselves. So do not start off by being critical of them and saying what the Yanks are going to do. Use your head before you sound off and remember how long the British alone held Hitler off without any help from anyone. In the pubs, you will hear a lot of Britons openly criticizing their government and the conduct of the war. That isn't an occasion for you to put in your two cents worth. It's their business, not yours. You sometimes criticize members of your own family but just let an outsider start doing the same and you know how you feel. I totally, I totally feel that. I totally get that. The Briton is just as outspoken and independent as we are, but don't get him wrong. He is also the most law-abiding citizen in the world because the British system of justice is just about the best there is. There are fewer murders, robberies, and burglaries in the whole of Great Britain in a year than in a single large American city. Once again, look, listen, and learn before you start telling the British how much better we do things. They will be interested to hear about life in America, and you have a great chance to overcome the picture many of them have gotten from the movies of an American made up of wild Indians and gangsters. <laughs> wow, man. 
Uh, when you find differences between British and American ways of doing things, there is usually a good reason for them. You know, for the most part, I think that American people and British people, I think we've, throughout history, we've been very, very similar in most ways. We just have certain differences about the way we do things. Um, but in the big scheme of things, we're, we're cousins, you know what I mean? British railways have dinky freight cars, which they call goods wagons, not because they don't know any better. Small car allow quicker handling of freight at the thousands and thousands of small stations. British automobiles are little and low powered. That's because all the gasoline has to be imported over thousands of miles of ocean. British taxi cabs have comic looking front wheel structures. Watch them turn around in a 12 foot street and you'll understand why. Yeah, I, I, I get that now. I, I now understand how small the roads are in some areas comparatively. Um, you know, it just makes sense. Smaller landmass, you're going to have smaller roads. I mean, plus a lot of the cities and towns, you know, the structure of them was built a long time ago when you didn't need as wide of roads. And now, unless you're going to tear down a bunch of houses or buildings, you can't really widen the, the roads in a lot of areas in Britain. So it just totally makes sense why... Um, why they'd be built like that. The British don't know how to make a good cup of coffee. You don't know how to make a good cup of tea. It's an even swap. That's, that's an interesting one. Wow. I personally don't really drink either. Uh, not really a coffee drinker, not really a tea drinker. Um, but uh, I definitely will say that, you know, a lot of people here are coffee drinkers. A lot of people drink ice, sweet iced tea, which I'm sure you guys know. Um, but... Uh, I know you guys do drink coffee over in the UK, but it is interesting. It seems like you do love your tea quite a bit more than the coffee, from what I understand. The British are leisurely, but not really slow. Their crack trains held world speed records. A British ship held the transatlantic rep record. A British car and a British driver set world speed records in America. Do not be offended if Britishers, that's the first time I've heard that term, a Britisher, hmm, do not be offended if Britishers do not pay as full respect to national or regional colors as Americans do. The British do not treat the flag as such an important symbol as we do. But they pay more frequent respect to their national anthem. In peace or war, God save the king, or the same tune of our America, is played at the conclusion of all public gatherings such as theater performances. Is that still going on today? I have a feeling that's not quite um, going on as much after all these events in Britain as it used to be. The British consider it bad form not to stand at attention, even if it means missing the last bus. If you're in a hurry, leave before the national anthem is played. That's considered all right. On the whole, British people, whether English, Scottish, or Welsh, are open and honest. If you are on furlough and puzzled about directions, money, or customs, most people will be anxious to help you as long as you speak first and without bluster. The best authority on all problems is the nearby Bobby, policeman, in his steel helmet. British police are proud of being able to answer almost any question under the sun. I know the helmets they're talking about. Those are made of steel. Are they still made of steel? No, they're, they're not made of steel today, I don't think. Wow. Man, those things had to be hot. I can only imagine. Um, they're not in a hurry, and they'll take plenty of time to talk to you. The British will welcome you as friends and allies, but remember that crossing the ocean doesn't automatically make you a hero. There are housewives in aprons and youngsters in knee pants in Britain who have lived through more high explosives and air raids than many soldiers saw in the last war. Wow. Wow. That really, really helps put into perspective what the British people had gone through. At this point, in, in, you know, by 1943, at home in America, you were in a country at war. Since your ship left port, however, you have been in a war zone. You will find that all Britain is a war zone and has been since September 1939. All this has meant great changes in the British way of life. Every light in England is blacked out every night and all night. Every highway signpost has come down and balloons have gone up. Grazing land is now plowed for wheat, and flower beds turn into vegetable gardens. Britain's peacetime army of a couple of hundred thousand has been expanded to over two million men. Everything from the biggest factory to the smallest village workshop is turning out something for the war, so that Britain can supply arms for herself, for Libya, India, Russia, and every front. 
Hundreds of thousands of women have gone to work in factories or joined the many military auxiliary forces. Old time social distinctions are being forgotten as the sons of factory workers rise to be officers in the forces and the daughters of noblemen get jobs in munition factories. But more important than this is the effect of the war itself. The British have been bombed night after night and month after month. Thousands of them have lost their houses, their possessions, their families. Gasoline, clothes, and railroad travel are hard to come by, and incomes are cut by taxes to an extent we Americans have not even approached. One of the things the English always had enough of in the past was soap. Now it is so scarce that girls working in the factories often cannot get the grease off their hands or out of their hair, and food is more strictly rationed than anything else. Wow. Wow. You know, it's like, it's hard to understand what happened so long ago until you actually read something like this. I mean, this is just, it's such a, such a vivid description of what the British people had gone through up until 1943, you know, between 1939 and 1943, what was going on at in 1943. For many months, the people of Britain have been doing without things which Americans take for granted. But you will find their shortages, discomforts, blackouts, and bombings have not made the British depressed. They have a new cheerfulness and a new determination born out of hard times and tough luck. After going through what they have been through, it's only human nature that they should be more than ever determined to win. You are coming to Britain from a country where your home is still safe, food is still plentiful, and lights are still burning. So it is doubly important for you to remember that the British soldiers and civilians have been living under a tremendous strain. It is always impolite to criticize your hosts. It is militarily stupid to insult your allies. So stop and think before you sound off about lukewarm beer or cold boiled potatoes or the way English cigarettes taste. If British civilians look dowdy and badly dressed, it is not because they do not like good clothes or know how to wear them. All clothing is rationed and the British know that they help war production by wearing an old suit or dress until it cannot be patched any longer. Old clothes are good form. One thing to be careful about if you are invited into a British home and the host exhorts you to eat up, there's plenty on the table. Go easy. It may be the family's rations for a whole week spread out to show their hospitality. It is always said that Americans throw more food into their garbage cans than any other country eats. It is true. We have always been a producer nation. Most British food is imported even in peace times. And for the last two years, the British have been taught not to waste the things that their ships bring in from abroad. British seamen die getting those convoys through. The British have been taught this so thoroughly that they now know that gasoline and food represent the lives of merchant sailors. And when you burn gasoline needlessly, it will seem to them as if you are wasting the blood of those seamen. When you destroy or waste food, you have wasted the life of another sailor. Wow. Wow. I can't even imagine, man. I can't even imagine the strain and the stress and the hard ships that the British people were going through in this time. This gives me a little bit of an idea of how rough it really was. Wow. A British woman officer or non-commissioned officer can and often does give orders to a man private. The men obey smartly and know it is no shame. For British women have proven themselves in this war. They have stuck to their post near burning ammunition dumps, delivered messages afoot after their motorcycles have been blasted from under them. They have pulled aviators from burning planes. They have died at the gun post, and as they fell, another girl has stepped directly into the position and carried on. There is not a single record in this war of any British women in uniformed service quitting her post or failing in her duty under fire. Now you understand why British soldiers respect the women in uniform. They have won the right to the utmost respect. When you see a girl in khaki or Air Force blue, remember she didn't get it for knitting more socks than anyone else. Almost before you meet the people, you will hear them speaking English. 
At first, you may not understand what they are talking about, and they might not understand what you say. The accent will be different from what you're used to, and many of the words will be strange or apparently wrongly used, but you will get used to it. You will have more difficulty with some of the local dialects. It may comfort you to know that a farmer or villager from Cornwall very often can't understand a farmer or villager in Yorkshire, but you will learn, and they will learn to understand you. Definitely, definitely learned. You guys have a ton, a ton of dialects, and I can definitely picture that uh, back in 1943, that was probably the truth, especially back then. You know, people were a little more traveled now, and with the internet and everything, you're more likely to hear other dialects throughout, you know, Great Britain, I'm sure. But back then especially, you know, uh, I'm sure there were a lot of people from certain villages that couldn't understand the people from a village, you know, 30 miles away or something like that. British slang is something you will have to pick up for yourself. But even apart from slang, there are many words which have different meanings from the way we use them, and many common objects have different names. For instance, instead of railroads, automobiles, and radios, the British will talk about railways, motor cars, and wireless sets. A railroad tie is a sleeper. A freight car is a goods wagon. A man who works on the railroad is a navy. Or is a navy. A streetcar is a tram. Automobile lingo is just as different. A light truck is a lorry. The top of a car is the hood. What we call the hood of the or the engine is a bonnet. The fenders are wings. A wrench is a spanner. Gas is petrol, if there is any. Your first furlough may find you in some small difficulties because of language differences. You will have to ask for sock suspenders to get garters and for braces instead of suspenders if you need any. If you're standing in line to buy, book, a railroad ticket, or a seat at the movies, cinema, you will be queuing, pronounced queuing, up before the booking office. If you want a beer quickly, you had better ask for the nearest pub. You will get your drugs at a chemist's, really, it's interesting, and your tobacco at a tobacconist, a tobacconist, a tobacconist, wow, okay. That's, a, that's the first time I've heard that one. Hardware at an ironmonger's. If you are asked to visit somebody's apartment, he or she will call it a flat. Be friendly, but don't intrude anywhere it seems you're not wanted. You will find the British money system easier than you think. A little study beforehand on shipboard will make it still easier. You are higher paid than the British Tommy. Don't rub it in. Play fair with him. He can be a pal in need. Don't show off or brag or bluster. Swank, as the British say. If somebody looks in your direction and says, he's chucking his weight about, you can be pretty sure you're off base. I, I understood that as soon as I heard that for some reason. You're chucking your weight about. That's the time to pull in your ears. If you're invited to eat with a family, don't eat too much. Otherwise, you may eat up their weekly rations. Don't make fun of British speech or accents. You sound just as funny to them, but they will be too polite to show it. Avoid comments on the British government or politics. Don't try to tell the British that America won the last war or make wisecracks about the war debts or about British defeats in this war. Never criticize the king or queen. Don't criticize the food, beer, or cigarettes to the British. Remember, they have been at war since 1939. Use common sense on all occasions. By your conduct, you have great power to bring about a better understanding between the two countries after the war is over. You will soon find yourself among a kindly, quiet, hard-working people who have been living under a strain such as few people in the world have ever known. In your dealings with them, let this be your slogan. It is always impolite to criticize your hosts. It is militarily stupid to criticize your allies. Wow. The idea of getting together with the British in solid friendship isn't a one-sided proposition. They, as well as we, believe in the necessity of being allies and the truest meaning of the word if we are to dish it out in full measure to Hitler. As a matter of fact, the British started the idea of providing soldiers with guidebooks to help them understand their allies. The first Royal Air Force cadets to come to the United States for training were given a little book called Notes for Your Guidance, which told them how to get along with Americans. Then, too, the British Army Bureau of Current Affairs issued a bulletin, Meet the Americans, to men in the army. Wow, guys, that was incredible. It was a really short read, but it gave me a lot of insights 
that I really didn't quite understand up until now about what life was like for the British people during World War II. And it's, this is the type of thing you just don't hear about on a regular basis. You know, you're taught bits and pieces of this in American schools, but let's be honest, you know, the British are going to be taught more British history and the Americans are going to be taught more American history. And although both our histories are intertwined, you know, you're not really in Amer on the American side, you're not going to hear as much about what the everyday British civilian was going through during World War II. Um, you know, and I'm guessing a lot of British civilians, you know, the younger Brits probably don't really understand what their grandfathers and great grandfathers were really going through. Um, you know, back during the Second World War. You know, this is the type of thing that the, unless you're really interested in history, especially for younger people. I know I was one of those people that when I was younger, I wasn't interested in history. I tuned it out for the most part. Um, you know, it just depends on a lot of a lot of young people aren't really interested in history, unfortunately. But, you know, it's one of the things that I definitely um, find very interesting now much more than I ever have. And I, and I think a lot of people, as they get older, they start seeing how important learning your history is. And not just learning your personal history, like in my case, the American history, but you know, my ancestry goes back to the UK and Ireland specifically. And so I really wanna learn about, you know, not just about the island and the landscape and the, and the, you know, the buildings and whatnot, but I wanna learn about the, you know, more modern, things and the more modern forms of history, like what went on in the Second World War in Britain, because um, it just helps me understand you guys the whole more, if you understand what I'm saying. But guys, this was fascinating, amazing. I learned so much uh, that I didn't really understand before. You know, it made me want to dive in and kind of, you know, look into just the World War One and World War Two. Uh, you know, in a more more in-depth manner. You know, I know the basics, right? I know what I learned in school. I know the bits and pieces I've I've kind of studied on my own here or there, but I have a long way to truly be able to understand the ins and outs of both these wars the way I'd like to. And so I'm probably going to start going on more of a journey with this uh, in the near future. Um, I think Lindsay might find, she's not into history that much, but I think she might find uh, this type of thing fascinating in some ways. So I, I'm going to see if she wants to come along with me on some of these videos that we'll probably check out and whatnot. If you have any recommendations for, uh, you know, videos about this type of topic uh, that you think I might find interesting, feel, please feel free to leave them in the comments, guys. But I hope you enjoyed that. It was a little bit different from what I normally do on my channel. You know, um, this was actually sent to me. Uh, shout out to Barry. Um, this was sent to me in a packet of stuff. I, it was I got it in the drawer in there. Um, it's called the Yank something. I can't remember exactly what the packet was, but it was all this World War II memorabilia and uh, or replicas of memorabilia. This is obviously, I believe this is a replica book. I can't imagine this. This is a real, the original, one of the original pamphlets is obviously a replica, I'm sure. Yeah, a replica. So, um, but, you know, I just thought, like, I, I was looking through that stuff and I was and I was like, just it's so interesting seeing that stuff, you know, unless you actually I don't think most people actually come across this stuff very often unless they are true history buffs or truly into something like World War II. And so I just thought it would be really interesting to share this with you guys, because I'm thinking a lot of you would find this interesting. Um, but I'm super happy I got to, to read that. And, you know, there's some other really cool stuff in that in that uh, in that uh, little packet there. Um, but this was the thing that I thought would be really interesting to share with you guys. Um, but yeah, guys, I think that's enough for me. Um, I'm going to go and hang out and uh, relax. Um, hope you guys have a great afternoon or evening or morning, whenever you're seeing this. Have a great day. Um, but yeah, I'll see you next time. Please click that like button, guys. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and feel free to drop your comments or suggestions about this video or others. Until next time, guys. Peace.